Let me take you back to the East India Company for just a minute. The East India Company was so atrocious to the rest of the world that the cries from the rest of the world came into the ears of the Queen and she disbanded the East India Company. But they only disbanded in terms of its military, they were the military arm of the British Empire. But the intelligence of the East India Company went underground and became known as the East India House. Then they became known as the Chatham House. Today, they're still in existence. They're known as the Royal Institute of International Affairs. One of the highest ranking organizations of the New World Order. Higher than the Trilateral Commission. Now let me tell you about the East India House because it became the hidden authority of the British Empire. And see, you don't know this because whoever hears about stuff like this, where do you hear about it? It took me eight years to do the research. There were some amazing people in the East India House. It was a huge think tank. Let me tell you who was part of it. Charles Darwin was part of the East India House. Karl Marx, the father of communism, East India House. Frederick Engels, his mentor, East India House. The teachings of Thomas Malthus. He wasn't alive then, but his teachings were alive and well in the East India House. He's the one that was in favor of eugenetics and race science and population control. Uh, some of the existentialist writers like Thoreau and Emerson, people that believed that man could transcend himself and become like God. The, 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 the uh, philosophy of the New Age movement today evolved from the East India House. Also in that house was a man by the name of John Ruskin. Now he took the pieces of their brains and took them into his own. And he began to believe that there could be a global British empire, a new world order that would, that would establish the ideals of this superior empire, but globally. And he would go out to Oxford and Cambridge and he would preach to them about his dream about a new world order. This is in the late 1800s, okay? The new world order ain't new. And one day while he was preaching, his words fell upon the ears of a man by the name of Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes picked up on the vision and said, I'm going to give my life and my fortune to seeing this come to pass. Kind of like an anti-kingdom of God beast. And... Uh, he created inside of the East India House an inner nexus of men called the Round Table. Maybe you've heard of the Round Table. It was a throwback to the Knights Templar. The Round Table became the inner think tank of the East India House. And these men plotted and schemed. And there were some amazing men. Rothschild was part of it. Milner. Uh, uh, Alfred Balfour, you've heard of his name, the Balfour Declaration that allowed the Jews to come back to Palestine in 1917. He was part of the Round Table. Powerful men with great vision. And they figured out that if they could gain control of money, the God of this world, the mammon of unrighteousness, if they could master money and control money, they could effectively take over this country. So they figured out that the way to do it would be to usurp the powers of Congress. Because it says in the powers of Congress that Congress has the power to coin money and regulate its value. It's a power given by the people of the United States to the Congress. It's part of the Constitution. It's part of the Republic in which we live. They thought if we could just somehow find a way to get that money power where we could print the money. Remember fractional banking? We could, how would you like to be able to print all the money? That'd be pretty cool. Print up a billion. <laughs> That's what they do. They want to bail out Southeast Asia. Hey, Greenspan, print up 50 billion for the Y2K problem. They just print it. How did the British figure out how to do this? Well, they, they established the depression in 1907 in the United States that set the people up. And by contracting currency, there wasn't enough money to go around. So they fomented a, and established a depression in 1907 and set the country up so that they were cash poor. The government then was manipulated by a man by the name of uh, uh, Warburg. Warburg was a Rothschild agent sent over from England 
And he, he masterminded a bill that was written by brilliant businessmen on a place called Jekyll Island, of all places, off the coast of Georgia. It's a rich man's retreat, the Jekyll Island document. And there they figured out through two different documents, one was called, uh, the, uh, it was the, uh, I can't think of the bill that didn't pass, but they put it in as a bill called the Federal Reserve Act. Well, that's what happened. In 1913, on December 23rd, with only three members of Congress present, they voted unanimously to pass this bill while everybody was home for Christmas. And the Federal Reserve Act set up the Federal Reserve System, which is the American banking system, but it's not American, and it's not a reserve, <laughs> and it's not federal. <laughs> it's been given that name to deceive you. It happens to be a corporation. Now, the United States government, by law, cannot own a corporation. So who owns it? Good question, huh? Because the taxes that you pay on the interest, on the money that's lended out that we have to pay interest on and taxes on, where you spend five months of your life working to pay, goes to the people that own the Federal Reserve System, which is the American banking system. When you pay your taxes, it doesn't go to the IRS, it goes to... <laughs> it doesn't go to England. Did somebody say England? It goes to the Federal Reserve Bank. So who owns it? Well, some of the richest banking houses in the world own the stock and make the decisions by putting people in office that do their bidding that determine the policy of the Federal Reserve System. So the Federal Reserve was effectively set up in 1913, immediately after debt was built up by starting the wars. Nations have to borrow money to build their war machine. And then after they blow each other up, they have to borrow more money to rebuild their infrastructure. So huge debt was created by the wars. When the war was over in 1917, the round table got Woodrow Wilson, who was president of the United States, and they set him up in office to go around the world and say, you know, we've got to quit these wars. Let's have a new world order, although they called it at that time the League of Nations. It was the first attempt politically to set up the new world order in this century. There were some great men in Congress that vetoed it. They wouldn't go for it. The rest of the world went for it. Woodrow Wilson did his job, but not in the United States. He failed, died a broken man, repented on his deathbed, and said, I've unknowingly sold out my country. Can you imagine that? When the league failed in the United States, the round table set up a western branch here in the United States. Only they didn't call it the round table here. They called it the Council of Foreign Relations, the CFR. Anybody that endeavors to be in political office in this country has to go through somehow connection with the CFR. It's the inner, it's the club that determines people that go to high places in government. When the Western branch was set up in 1939, <clears throat> the round table and the CFR met to redesign the League of Nations, only this time they would call it the United Nations. When the war was over, the UN was set up in San Francisco, it's been moved to Manhattan in New York, and it was set up by Britain and the United States.